Let the meltdown begin. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network. I am Gabriel Morenci. Let's do this thing. Got a great show lined up for you tonight. Stitch Duran, one of our favorite people in mixed martial arts and one of our all-time favorite guests on the program, returns to the meltdown. Stitch Duran kicks it with us. The Fight Network's John Ramdy joins me in studio. We'll crunch some numbers with the best odds maker in the business, Joey Odessa, as we pick up the pieces following the Super Bowl card in New Jersey, UFC. 169, Barrow Faber. Same result, a little bit of controversy. Eh, pretty clear that Barrow is a badass. Aldo gets it done, and it seems as though people are getting bored with Aldo's dominance. Dana White wants a super fight with Anthony uh, Pettis. Frank Mir in a lot of trouble right now, and over him, back in black. We're gonna break that down and more on tonight's MMA Meltdown. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I'm really excited to talk to uh, the man who's about to join us uh, right now. And I don't just say that uh, because uh, he's waiting on hold, but I do believe that Stitch Duran is the nicest guy in mixed martial arts, uh, bar none. As you know, Stitch is like Switzerland. He's neutral. Everybody loves him, including the viewers of this program. Stitch Duran steps up and then Stitch, it's always a pleasure, my man. How you doing? Oh, man, thanks for getting me the call here, Gabe. I'm doing all right, man. Just kind of kicking back. You know, I've had a couple quick uh, trips to the cold tundras, and I was in Minnesota, Chicago, and then Newark, and it's nice to get back uh, to Las Vegas where the sun is shining. Well, I tell you what, uh, it's been an unusually cold uh, winter on the East Coast, and uh, not just here uh, in Toronto. In the last couple of winters, I was in Las Vegas, and you know, I wasn't too happy to spend a winter in Toronto uh, this year. <laughs> but I said to myself, ah, it won't be that bad. And man, I was wrong. It's awful, Stitch. It's like, it's a living hell. It's only February right now. And there's no end in sight to this polar vortex uh, crap. But you were in uh, Newark slash uh, New York uh, this past weekend, Super Bowl weekend, UFC 169. Uh, how, did, how did you enjoy yourself, uh, Stitch, down there? Well, it was it was all right. I mean, it was you know, after a while, you know, you just kind of want to stay in the hotel because you don't want to stay too cold and get those bones deep, you know. But uh, the fights ended up being great. You know, uh, Jamie Varner, uh, you know, he was in a battle, and it was you know, it was, it was heartbreaking to see him get knocked out on such a such a great total to toe fight. Uh, but uh, it was it was an awesome night as usual. And you know, uh, it's. You had a couple of title uh, shots. Uh, Frank Mir could be the end of the end of an era for Frank Mir against uh, Overeem, but the Trujillo Varner fight that stands out to me the most as well. Yeah, that was that was a hell of a fight, man. So a uh, stitch. You know, that was UFC 169. Do you remember what was your first UFC? Because I'm thinking you've been coming on the show for a long time. It's been a lot of years. I'm horrible for UFC numbers and stuff like that, but I think we started having you on in the 80s. Uh, type of deal, not the 1980s, but the UFC, <laughs> the UFC 80s, or it might have been the uh, the late 70s. But when was your first UFC show, uh, Stitch? Oh man, by then I was already a veteran, Gabe. You know, I started in uh, UFC 33, and that was, I think, the second show that the UFC put together. And uh, you know, Dana White and, and them uh, when they started off, and there was like 12 employees in Zufa, and now there's like. 300, 350 employees, and uh, so yeah, you know, me and Don House, uh, we were kind of like the originators. Leon Tabs, uh, we were the first three amigos to be doing what we do now. But it's uh, it's been a lot of years, man, and uh, you know, I love every moment of it. And so yeah, UFC 33, so the second card after Zufa took over, huh? Yeah, you know, and it was funny because I knew basically nothing about the MMA industry, and you know, the first two guys that I rap were Dave Manet and uh, Jens Pulver. And, uh, you know, they were part of the military camp. And, you know, knowing what I know now, uh, these guys were, you know, they were big names. And, uh, and, and so was Pat Militich, you know. So I was with, with royalty, not even knowing that, uh, that I was in there with the big boys. But it was uh, it's kind of a nice experience knowing what I know now. <laughs> and, uh, so you didn't know much. What was your first impression then, coming from the world of boxing, what was your first impression about mixed martial arts? First time you know, you're doing it live and wrapping gloves. What, was, uh, what stuck out to you the most? 
Well, you know, I, I I quit watching the UFC, you know, before, you know, Lorenzo and Dana and then bought the company. And, you know, when Dana gave me a call, you know, they let me know that they had implemented something like 33 rules and all that. Because for me, before, it was just, it was too brutal for the, for what I do as a cut man. What I saw was, uh, it, it, it was just, it was tough. And then with these guys uh, implementing the rules, it gave me the incentive to come in. But, uh, yeah, you know, going to wrap hands, uh, the technique was a little bit different than it was for boxing because, the gloves were smaller and all that, but once you start seeing multiple cuts and and knockouts and all that, you know, it uh, that was kind of a cup of tea that uh, I like to drink, man. And and uh, you know, it's like right <laughs> up my alley. So I think I blended into the mixed martial arts world pretty well. And you know, Stitch, there's so many people in the world of boxing when mixed martial arts, you know, started to climb the ladder. There were so many haters. Oh, it's terrible. And even now to this day, there's still the resistance. And a lot of guys have come around. Bernard Hopkins uh, used to really hate it. Now he's come around uh, on mixed martial arts. But you're one of the few people that have made money in both industries, Stitch. Yeah, you know what? And, and, and I really have thank God every day that I'm in that position to be doing that. And you're absolutely right, Gabe. I mean, you know, I say how many guys are really in a position to have worked or continue to work with the greatest fighters in boxing, the mixed martial arts, and and even kickboxing. You know, so I've been real blessed to be in those positions, and and you know, I don't take that opportunity lightly. And you know, I, I to me, it's just it's a complete honor. It seems like kickboxing right now is uh, is trending upward, Stitch, especially in North America, in the United States, and Canada as well. People are really starting to pay attention to Glory and uh, Pat Barry. Uh, going back to the kickboxing uh, world. And I think that's a good move uh, for Pat. You know, if you've got, and, and Pat Barry's so damn talented, so entertaining and so much fun to watch, but it sucks if dudes are just going to take him down and lie on top of him. I think he's better off in this realm where he can display his, uh, his skills because this guy was lethal in the kickboxing world before MMA. Yeah, you know what, I think, you know, for Glory and I, you know, whenever I have dates available and Glory has a show off, I'll do those. I did the last one in New York, and it was it was nice getting back to my kickboxing background. And uh, but to see you know uh, Pat get into what he really specializes in, I think he's going to be a big name in that. And uh, you know the experience and, and the mentality growing up in the mixed martial arts, or learning that in the mixed martial arts, I think is only going to help him in uh, in kickboxing. So uh, it it should be fun. But you know I was. I was working with Dennis Alexia in the days of Johnny Terrio and, you know, some of the great Canadian fighters. So it's nice to get and see the, the game of kickboxing kind of resurrect itself also and Glory's doing a good job. That's what got me into mixed martial arts, uh, Stitch, being from Montreal, actually. You know, I was born in Montreal and Jean-Yves Terrio was the man. You know, the guy was a legend. And, uh, you know, all my roommates, everybody was, uh, you know, taking karate and, you know, I knew a dude who was like a, a trainer. He was a black belt and buddies with Terry. You know, that's why Montreal, actually, you know, George St. Pierre. I mean, Montreal, a great fighting town from boxing. But Johnny Terry, it's kind of that bridge uh, into mixed martial arts. And they used to have it on the reservations uh, in Montreal. Now, a Stitch, one thing I'm always fascinated by, and I've been lucky enough a couple of times to be backstage before a fight. And, I, you know, once I was lucky enough to be in a room, uh, before a fight, and I always love the video, you know, blogs and vlogs uh, of the footage in the room, and you get that opportunity to be face-to-face -face with the fighters before some of the biggest moments of their life, uh, Stitch, and, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, because all fighters are different, and you've been around all these guys, so I wanted to ask you, like, uh, who's, the, uh, who's the scariest guy you're wrapping his gloves up, and, you know, he's all the silent assassin type and you're thinking to yourself, I'm glad I'm not the one fighting this guy. <laughs> That's a good question, man. But I tell you, the guy that always gives shit out of me all the time, uh, whether he's in the ring or outside of the ring, was Chuck Liddell. <laughs> you know, it was, it, he was a person that you just could not read. And, you know, Chuck's a great guy, but just looking at him and, and, and not knowing who he is, uh, man, he's probably the most intimidating guy out there. Not to say he isn't one of the nicest guys, which he is. You know, but Chuck Liddell used to be uh, used to be quite scary, and you know, a lot of guys when I walk in and you see me in the dressing room, you know, I, I like to break their nervousness by joking around with them and what have you not. And uh, you know, some guys you could do it to and, and get them out of that nervous stage for that moment. Uh, but Chuck, uh, I, I wouldn't even try to 
could tell the joke or anything like that because I might have been his first knockout victim before he walked out to the audience. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've sat uh, with Chuck Liddell before, and a true story, Stitch. I was doing a live show at Palace Station, and Chuck Liddell sitting like to the right of me. It was like Super Bowl weekend. I knocked the beer over into Chuck Liddell's lap. Like, uh, into his lap. Like, it looked like he pissed himself. Like, into his lap. I look over, and I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, my God. I'm thinking, this is no joke. Like, I just spilt a beer all over Chuck Liddell's freaking lap, man. <laughs> Liddell looks at me, and, like, he, he raises his hand to hit me, kind of. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, this ain't, I'm like, this ain't good, man. This ain't good. <laughs> but Liddell kind of just playfully hits me in the arm. He's like, you're a freak. He's like, you're a freaking idiot. <laughs> I'm like, he's like, you're a freaking idiot. I'm like, sorry, Chuck. And, Chuck was all laughs about it and all smiles after it. Of all guys, I was doing another, another live show, Stitch, and uh, well, one of our listeners was there. You know how we do it. We got a bunch of crazy fans. Yeah. And, you know, we're at Blondie's in Vegas. And uh, one of my buddies spills a drink on Phil Baroni, of all people, who really might be the craziest guy <laughs> like in, in, in mixed martial arts. And Baroni's like, what the hell is this? But, you know, Chuck Liddell and Phil Baroni, two of the nicest guys out there. They're, they're, they're badasses, but they're actually really, really cool guys. So who's the funniest guy? You like to break the ice. When you're wrapping the gloves, who's the guy that's cracking jokes and, like, you'd think, man, this guy isn't even about to get into a fight in 10 minutes? <laughs> well, you know what? There's, there's and, and that's another good question. And uh, God, I, you know, there's a lot of guys that you know. Once we break the ice, you know, we sit there and we have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, Cole Miller's pretty funny when it comes to you know just staying relaxed. Uh, Jamie Barner just over the week, you know, he's a great guy, and I've worked many, many fights with uh, Jamie Barner, and we've had a great relationship. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about him. We did a seminar or uh, auto gas signing seminars in Tampa. And we went out and partied, and I guess Jamie knew he was going to, you know, party a little bit more than he should have. So with a Sharpie, he puts on his forearm. He says, my name is Jamie Barner, and it's lost. I am staying at the Embassy Suites at this number. And uh, and <laughs> you know, over the weekend in the, in the dressing room, we're talking about that moment, you know. And, uh, but, you know, these are some of the guys. But, that, you know, I, I try to, you know, I, I try to work with them. I try to kind of joke around with them. And, but, you know, Cole Miller... Uh, guys, you know, I'm going to have to really sit down and think about who, who are funny guys, but, you know, there's more of being funny. It's just more of, of, of breaking the tension, you know, when I, when I talk to these guys. Do you notice, Stitch, um, younger fighters, or maybe not younger in age per se, but guys, you know, making their UFC debuts or maybe their second fight, do you notice the more the tension or some of the new guys sort of like real freaking tense as opposed to a guy like Varner that's been around and he's cracking jokes? No, you know what? Not, not not really. You know, it's everybody has a certain personality walking into the dressing room, and and uh, you know you can see some guys are nervous. There's some guys I've wrapped pants, and they literally start crying like babies. You know, so you know psychology is one of the strong points that I bring into the table uh, game. Yeah. And yeah, I know when I did Misha Tate uh, when I ran that did, when I wrapped Misha Tate when she fought Ronda Rousey. You know, uh, Brian Carrowell says you know since we want you to wrap her hands not only because you do a good job, but on the psychological edge, you know, you know how to relax a person, you know how to get them on, on the right track and all that. And, and, you know, doing what I do in the dressing room, to me, is, is that, that's an extremely important uh, part of what I do. And, and it just, uh, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. But I've seen personalities change where a guy is nervous or a guy is crying when I'm rapping them. And, you know, right at the end, you know, they're giving me a hug and thanking me, and then they go out there and take care of, uh, take care of business. Uh, Stitch Duran uh, with uh, Stitch. There's so much uh, I love to throw at you, but I don't. I never want to get you in trouble. And I'm thinking, man, I'd like to ask him about this guy and uh, what happened there, but I don't want to get you in trouble. But I'll ask you not who's the worst, because one thing I'm always fascinated by as well is the the corner men. And it seems to me that a lot of the new guys, they got some pretty bad corner men. You know, they'll tell them, you know, you got to knock them out. They're giving them no advice whatsoever. Or you get other guys who are delusional. Tell the guy you're doing great when he's clearly losing the fight. So I'll ask you, who's the best? Because when I look at this, and people are always talking about the best camps. Uh, but I look at Faraz in Montreal with TriStar. 
He seems to tell it like it is to his fighters. Hey, we lost that round. We got to do this. We got to do this better. We got to do that better. Uh, Jackson's pretty good at it as well, it seems, as far as being real, calming the fighters down. So I won't ask you who the worst guys are. And do you hear what they're saying? Are you working? Are you in such a zone that you don't really hear what the, what the corner are telling the fighters in between rounds? Oh, no, I do. I, I got the best hit in the house, and, 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 you know, I do. How can you not listen to these corners, you know, because they're yelling out the instructions? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's often uh, when, when I see a good corner, and, you know, and I tell these young fighters, you know, listen to your corner because I've seen a lot of fights and a lot of great fighters that follow the instructions of the corners win fights because it's a team effort. And, uh, you know, one, one of the best, if not the best, that I, I, I always see and, and, and see good success with is, is Greg Jackson. You know, and uh, Greg, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there and I, I'm listening to instructions. And, you know, a lot of times these guys are yelling, Gabe, and, and the fighters at the other side of the outfit gone. And, and for the most part, you've got the whole team yelling, and you can't understand a thing that they're saying. So the fighters are basically doing their fighting on auto speed. But, you know, Greg Jackson, what makes him a little bit different than everybody is his voice is a little bit shriekier than the average guy. And, and his voice always pops up and it comes up to the top of the, of the audio. And, and these guys, I mean, I've seen all these fighters that followed his T, right, his instructions right to the T and have done very well. So I got to say, you know, Greg Jackson to me is, is definitely on top of the list of one of the best guys that work the corner. Uh, Stitch Duran uh, with us. Uh, Stitch, I'd love to uh, go on and on uh, with you, but we got to wrap it up here. It's always a pleasure, my man. I look forward to uh, seeing you again. Keep up uh, the great work, and uh, we encourage people to check out uh, Stitch on Twitter. Check out his website as well, where you can purchase his book. It's great stuff, uh, great stories of Stitch's childhood growing up uh, into the, uh, the sport of uh, mixed martial arts. Uh, Stitch, it's always a pleasure, my man. Hey, anytime. I told you, Dave, it's a uh... It's always fun just talking to you on phone, but hanging out with you one-on-one is always the best way. Yeah, yeah, I know. I miss you, man. I, I look forward to uh, to stirring the pot to, once again uh, as well. Right, well it's, it's been too long. Always a pleasure, my man. Yeah, I got that. There's uh, Stitch Duran with us. And, uh, you know, great guy, class act, uh, Stitch Duran. And like I said, you're not going to find anyone in mixed martial arts. Oh, I, I don't like Stitch. Everybody likes uh, Stitch Duran. All right, MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. We're not done yet. Let's, uh, let's do this thing. <music> MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I am Gabriel Morenci. Thanks to Stitch Duran for uh, joining us on the program. We go from Stitch Duran to the Fight Network's very own, John Ramdeen. Uh, John, it's always a pleasure, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, as always. I uh, uh, always, uh, always love having you on uh, the program. And uh, you know what? You are the uh, the number one glory uh, fan. When I'm talking glory, I go to, go to you, uh, Rammer, here. And uh, Pat Barry made news last week, retiring from mixed martial arts, but uh, will be fighting uh, under the glory banner right now. Uh, John, you like this move? I think it makes sense for him. Obviously, uh, fighting in the UFC had a difficult time because you know he came from a kickboxing background. He stuck to his kickboxing roots. Of course, we've seen some improvements in the, the, the wrestling game, the grappling game, but essentially people tune in to see Pat Berry stand and bang. And uh, you know, obviously, if, if that's your game plan, if you're not focused on the other facets of the game, you're not gonna be successful. So I think this move for him to go over to glory to go to his bread and butter i think that makes a lot of sense now will he be successful that that's another question right because this is common perception almost that well you know barry struggled on the ground he struggled with the bigger guys but as i read on liver kick as they very wisely pointed out a lot of his losses were just knockouts they weren't you know because he was out wrestled so to speak he just got knocked out uh, well, as far as the, the state of glory right now, you, you drop Pat Barry in here. Where does he fit into the equation, in your opinion? Yeah, it's going to be very difficult for Pat Barry to make the transition into the kind of heavyweight landscape if that's where he decides to call home, or even 205 pounds, because, I mean, Tyrone Spong competes yeah. at 205 pounds. He's kind of a pounds. tweener, though, isn't he? Yeah. That's, that's a problem for him. And I think that's what you look at. This is a guy that just used his name to come up with some interesting fights. You know, a fight with Jerome LeBanner, a guy 
that's kind of in the twilight of his career, I think would be an interesting matchup. Uh, be, just because, you know, they're both bangers. They're both not maybe most the most technical guys when it comes to kickboxing, but they're, they're names, and I think people would tune in. Even a fight like Sergey Haritanov, you know, can Pat Berry win those fights? I don't know, but I think they're intriguing. You put Pat Berry up against some of the, the top guys at heavyweight, I just don't know if he's going to be able to compete with a guy like Daniel Gita, for example. Does this, does this help uh, Glory, in your opinion, to get uh, somebody from the UFC? It'll bring sort of, you know, the average UFC fan might sort of pay attention now. Or do you not want to see UFC rejects, uh, so to speak, uh, going? No, I, I actually like the idea because, exactly, people are tuning into Spike TV, for example. They may not know the Glory brand, but they hear that Pat Berry's competing on the, sh the card. They, they might be intrigued enough to tune in and then get thrilled by other, the other fights in the card. Now, um, one of the fights that I got wrong this past week, although... I'm not gonna, you know, not uh, gonna beat myself up for getting a plus 330 underdog wrong. But I didn't think that uh, that Overeem should have been a four to one favorite against Frank Mir. Frank Mir is in a tough spot right now. This guy just can't get a win. Yet the rumors were flying fast and furious. And one of the reasons why I was I took a shot with Mir here, John, was because I heard, you know, Reams in Amsterdam. He's mending, you know, mending the the fences, so to speak patching things up with former managers and the kickboxing crowd. And there was all kinds of rumors that if Overeem lost, he was going to be let go by the UFC because it would have been his third loss in a row. And that he was going to turn up in glory, but he gets Frank Mir and wins. <laughs> so it's like, oh, well, I guess I'll stay in the UFC for a little while longer. But clearly, he was working on something. Yeah, I mean, over him, though, he's been in this game for a long, long time. He's had good people helping him throughout his career. And he knows that if, you know, he happened to lose against Frank Mir and that was at the end of his UFC run, he wasn't going to stop competing there. The guy's in the prime of his life, and he's here to make money. And if he can make money, whether it be Glory, whether it be K1, or just one-off He can make 250000 fighting Todd Duffy and egg, tomato cans. Egg, well, that's, that's, you know, that's the reality of things right now or a guy like uh, an organization like Bellator would die to pick up a guy like Alistair Overeem I don't think there's any problems with Alistair Overeem and I think the guy even if he had a loss to Frank Mir I think he's still such a big name the UFC would have given him another chance anyway he is so charismatic and so damn marketable isn't it because yeah. even with the one win now suddenly he's hot again yeah oh he's you know an Overeem this Overeem that uh, and, you know, the UFC wanted nothing more than have Overeem against Cain Velasquez a couple of years ago. They thought it would have, would have been huge ass of money, uh, but it never came uh, to be. Now, speaking of the UFC, Uriah Faber falls uh, short once again. Not a huge surprise that, you know, people say, oh, it's a controversy. Uh, maybe there should be a third fight. I don't think there should be a third fight. Uriah finds himself in a tough spot. He's only, he is... I saw someone compare him to Peyton Manning on Twitter. I think it's a good comparison. They both were champions before, but going to be a day late, dollar short every time. Yeah, the problem with Uriah Faber, actually, it's not really a problem because outside of Henan Burrell, he's still the number two 135-pound fighter in the world. It's You put up anybody up against Uriah Faber, and he's probably going to beat them. Uh, it wasn't an early stoppage, in my opinion. Yes, it was an early stoppage, but, you know, it's the heat of the moment. Hennon Brow's an absolute animal. He's raining down punches. Faber went down. Herb Dean's the best in the business. Yeah. You, you just have to make a split-second decision, and maybe he didn't see Faber giving the thumbs up, but, you know, there's so much going on. The crowd's, uh, you know going bananas so it's, it's a difficult situation to be in but you have to imagine that Uriah Faber given the opportunity he would have tried his best to fight back but you know that's that's what happens in the fight game yeah that's why you got to be careful when you bet on the totals uh, yeah. in a fight game too everyone oh there's no way over him and Mir is uh, doesn't go uh, <laughs> you know doesn't go under one yeah, and a half yeah, rounds yeah. Bigfoot and Mark Hunt no yeah, way oh no that way. fight it's going to go under, going to go under, and then these fights are going to distance uh, right now. All right, Jeff, so we've got about a minute left. So John Lineker misses weight again. At least he lost. Uh, so uh, he misses weight again four times in but six. But he made it, though. He yeah, no, yeah, it, he, he, yeah he, got, he, he made the pound. He got down to 126 yeah. after the fact. Uh, you know, but that was four times uh, in six fights. Anthony Johnson got released. He missed weight three times in 11 fights. Uh, but Johnson is back taking on Phil Davis. 
Good for him. Six fight win streak. He gets rewarded for it. Nice to see the World Series of fighting. Works with the UFC. Doesn't get in the way of the fighter. Yeah, it's, I'm, there's no surprises. Anthony Johnson's a commodity. He's young. He's skilled. Works with a good team. Knocking guys out in spectacular fashion. And on top of that, he's a two division guy. Probably even a three division guy. Yes, he fights at 205 pounds. Has fought at heavyweight. And I wouldn't be surprised if he tests the water at 180. Tests the waters at 185 pounds. I think Anthony Johnson. You got to use this guy because he's exciting and he knows how to bang and can knock guys out. The Fight Network's uh, John Ramdane uh, with us. We've got our videos of the week coming up and we've got Joey Odessa joining us from Costa Rica. All that and more. MMA Meltdown continues. You are watching the Fight Network. This is MMA Meltdown. I'm Gabriel Morenci. Let's get to our videos of the week. Now, last week, there was a lot of talk in the MMA world about the so-called fight with Chael Sonnen and Vanderlei Silva. And I do find it interesting that everything that happens on The Ultimate Fighter is, um, is a non-disclosure contract. Nobody can say anything about anything that happens anywhere associated with the show, yet somehow everybody knew that they got into a fight and, oh, this season is going to be crazy. You know, that, you know, that whole event was his stage as Alistair Overeem calling out Brock Lesnar after his win the other night. Like, if you're Lesnar, uh, you know, you're sitting at home minding your own business and Overeem's calling you out. If you're Overeem, you, you don't call out Kane, you don't call out Verdum, you don't call out any of the top guys. You call out a guy who's freaking wrestling in the WWE uh, right now. And I, I believe that, you know, he was probably put up to that as well, as the UFC would like nothing better than for Brock Lesnar to come back. And maybe they're hoping, you know what, maybe if the guy that beat him you know, calls him out, maybe that'll make him actually want to come back. So uh, there's a lot of uh, stage stuff uh, going on. Like now, this fight wasn't stage. This is an oldie, but a goodie for people that didn't see it before. And we don't have any footage of the Chael Sone and Vanderlei Silva fight from the Ultimate Fighter, obviously, but you know, I just love Vanderlei Silva, you know, one of the funniest guys in mixed martial arts. And uh, if you've ever met Vanderlei, the dude, the dude should be a comedian. He's just freaking funny. And uh, here's Vanderlei Silva just minding his own business uh, backstage at an old school pride event and all hell breaks loose uh, with Crazy Horse in the house. Quality uh, old school carnage from the uh, backstage uh, pride uh, days uh, with, with Marcelo and uh, with Crazy Horse. I just love Vanderlei Silva refereeing it, uh, standing over the fight. Uh, that's good stuff. And, you know, from, from there, I was thinking to myself, we need more Silva on today's program. We, we need more Silva. And, you know, Silva's a big star. Dude's done some commercials in the past and some pretty cool commercials. Para qualquer luta, você tem que estar preparado. Muito treino, musculação, repertório, repertório de porrada. Na academia, que não pega pesado, é ovelhinha. Ovelhinha? Como esse papel aqui. Lá, ninguém delicadinho, fofinho. Nem a lona é macia. Porque numa luta, quem é suave ganha ponto. É ponto na cara. Né, ovelhinha? Bé! That's uh, just awesome. Stupid, stupid, uh, but awesome. How come uh, we don't see more UFC fighters uh, getting Charmin 
uh, deals. Now, here's another old school uh, video. Here, here's Vandalay and Mark Coleman hawking shaving cream. Shiksu protector. Wait, some way was shaving with jelly foam. So get him now. Oh, oh, oh. Next is blue metal. Haya, hi. Micro safety wire. De. Give it to him. Why, why is TV cooler like in every part of the world except here? We, we, we got lame ass commercials on TV. How come the, uh, the Brazilians, the Japanese, everybody gets cool freaking commercials? Uh, those, those, that's just awesome stuff. But uh, of, of all MMA uh, fighters, nobody cuts a better spot than the one and only New York badass. I'm Phil Baroni, and I'm gonna sell you a fucking car. If you wanna get a girl, you don't need no class. You need to get a car that's real badass. If you got no job and you got no cash, see New York Phil and get here fast. Come on down to New York Phil's and check out my badass cars. And nothing says badass like an 88 IROC. Z. You worried about the paint? How about I grab you in the back of the head and slam your head against this thing five times? What? You want a Carfax report? I got your Carfax right here. No credit. Bad credit. Even bankruptcies. I'm slashing prices so low, people think I'm f***ing crazy. Everybody knows Phil Baroni loves the kids. Bring them down this weekend. I'll set them up with their very own My Little Baroni Pony. And if you're worried about buying a car from me, don't. Just remember this little jingle. It won't be a phony. It comes from Baroni. We don't with this s***, yeah, man. Then the last take a while quality stuff with the New York badass. And we go from the New York badass to a good friend of the New York uh, badass. Another New York badass, so to speak, albeit in Costa Rica. Now we'll crunch some numbers with the best in the business while we return. Joey Odessa joins us next. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I'm Gabriel Morenci. Let's send it to Costa Rica, where we're joined by the premier combat sport odds maker in the business, bar freaking none, the one and only, Joey Odessa. Joey, it's always a pleasure. How you doing? Hey, what's happening tonight, G? Coming off a big Super Bowl week, fight week. Crazy. Yeah, it was a very busy uh, weekend this past uh, weekend, uh, Joey. And uh, it's been reported that the Las Vegas books, uh, record number, they took in $120 million on the Super Bowl. They made $19 million profit. The books uh, needed Seattle to win, and the books got their wish. But it seems like the public did a little bit better with the UFC, Joey, UFC 169, than they did the Super Bowl because a lot of those favorites, uh, you know, cashed it. There really weren't too many parlay busters along the way. Yeah, there was not. You know, the the Varner crowd was good. I mean, it started out what a war that was. You know, not to rear view it. That was uh, a great fight, wasn't it? Yeah, that was was a great fight. It really was. That that Trujillo, he, he deserved every bit of those bonuses. I mean, that kid... We talked about it, you know, like I said, I don't like to rearview mirror it, but, you know, that kid just showed something in his fights before that, you know, he's out there and, and the difference with the camps, Kenny Monday down there, you know, I don't want to coach Joe it, but I mean, I've seen, you know, it, it, it's actually a good lead in because uh, statistics wise, I mean, the Black Zillions have really come back, haven't they? Oh, first, they're, they're ruined and now they're, you know, now they've got so much momentum and, uh, you know, Anthony Johnson, right? I tell you what, you're right, Joey. And the Black Zillions, I don't know if they ever really came back. They never really did anything. They were kind of a collection of misfit guys. And, you know, I was always wondering about that, Jim. Who's the real leader? Uh, You know, you sort of got a lot of misfits and guys with bad attitudes that, you know, have left other camps that they all end up in Miami. And then we heard, Joey, that, you know, with Rashad hanging out with the Miami Heat at the nightclubs and sort of living that South Beach celebrity lifestyle. But then, boom, out of nowhere, these guys are just killing people. And they have a lot of misfits there. 
but they got a lot of talent and they got a lot of badasses in that gym, don't they? They got a lot of guys with attitude and I'm with you, Joey. Not to pull a Barry Horowitz in the rear view mirror here, but both you and I love Trujillo. Anyone that checked out my website saw that was my best bet. Uh, I love Trujillo in this fight. And as an underdog. As an underdog. And I said to people, I don't care what the line is. He's going to win the fight. Uh, the, to me, this guy's getting, yeah, he nearly lost. It was a great fight. But I'm with you. There's something about this kid, Joe. He's got something in him. I don't know if it's the street. It's some sort of inner toughness that a lot of other guys don't have. I like this guy. Yeah, he comes to fight, man. I mean, he he realizes that this is, uh, you know, he needs to win to advance. And, and I like him. I like his attitude. He's not out there for the applause. He's out there to win and and, and make money and, and carry on. I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm not saying title bouts or anything like that, but he went out there and, you know, he was getting, he took some shots. I mean, it was kind of, it was a great fight. I mean, especially if you had the winner. That's one of those take a marble out of the jar kind of fights where I say, you know, good beats, bad beats, they even out in the end. But, you know, one big thing about the Brazilian camp, and, you know, and I, and I preach it, and it's, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to pull statistics or anything, but when you get these new trainers in there, I mean, Kenny Monday's there, and the way people talk about Ludwig, you know, you might want to say something about Kenny Monday, Olympic champ, wrestler, amazing, I mean, just an amazing athlete. And when you get that kind of quality and you're around it every day, it's contagious. And, you know, just like winning and losing, we see it happen, and we, and we talked about it. I mean, heck, who really, you know, rear view mirror, but who really thought Pettis was going to get beat? I didn't think they'd get him beat in his, what, 11th or 12th fight in his UFC when he's got, you know, the brother on the bench and the big name behind him. I mean, he could... You know, arguably with a couple more wins, he might have been able to carry a card somewhere, one of these ultimate fighter cards. But I'm not a matchmaker, and, you know, I don't like talking about fantasy and stuff like that. So, Well, considering we considering how many cards they have, Joey, you might be the main event on a card soon. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, uh, you know, how, how do they pay? They, they're pay? These guys are making an all right living, and you know what? Cowboy it's, Cerrone's it's, making a decent living. The guy's fighting every two months now. Well, it's, a, it's not such a bad thing. It's a bad... I don't understand why when we go from five or six or seven events, whatever, back in the mid-2000s to more events, why people are complaining if they're free. They didn't know who these fighters were back then, the majority of them. These guys weren't even, a lot of the new fans don't know the, you know, the old days of the UFC and the MMA and the, the pride and the dream. When you bring up some of these organizations, you know, uh, you know, Super Bowl, Elite XC, I mean, the, I could go down, you know, there's just tons of lists, you know, that we could go down. And they, they don't recognize the history of it. And it's, I, I'm grateful for all the fights. I love a 52 week season. This is, uh, this is money. No, it, unfortunately, it's yeah. To keep up with. Unfortunately, this is one of the weeks where we don't have a card. Uh, but we got Musasi and uh, Machida a week and a half uh, away or so from this uh, taping. So, Joey, you know, we mentioned the Broncos and the Seahawks. Uh, seemed like a lot of people on Saturday were really hyping up Uriah Faber. And I love Uriah Faber. Uh, the guy's a great guy. He's a funny guy. He's a great fighter. But it was amazing to me. The number was actually lower than it was the first time they fought. We had a rematch here in which the fighter got completely dominated the first time around. And people bought into it. You always talk about the countdown shows, but people bought into it. Yeah, but look the way that he's destroyed the competition to get back. There's just such a gap between Burrell and everybody else in that division. But it, uh, right before fight, uh, fight time, the numbers started to go up. I think because the guys that wanted to bet on Burrell waited and then finally pounced. So you know, it, it went off at about 3.30, 3.40 or so, Joey. But I got in at 2.70 earlier in the day. Yeah, people don't realize, you know, a lot of that money that comes in late, you don't see it on these tickers and on these screens. And that's usually the, the big money. I mean, there's odds that are in a couple of weeks. And, you know, I don't know how many of them guys aren't going to fight on the card come, you know, next week. But, you know, the limits are so low that you don't see those. But, you know, we're not, it's better to just wait till the last minute. And if you don't get the price you're looking for, then you, you just pass on it. But in this case, I mean, I love Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan made painted that bout as a pick em, as good as anybody can paint it. He did a tremendous job. And it reflected in all the, I would say it affected the wager counts probably in about a three or four to one ratio against the favorite, which is not that big of a uh, gap considering he was, you know, below minus 300. Now for, you know, a six to one favorite, you know, the, the, the Lamas fight, it's a, you know, it's a different story. 
you know, you'd have a higher percentage of, uh, you know, smaller bet guys taking shots on the underdog, which, again, turned up to be a lame duck. And people at him, they, they did a good job with these preview shows. You know, because I didn't second guess myself. Once we hit enter, it's all done. But, um, you know, with these, uh, with these preview shows, they could definitely, I could see how yeah, they put people on the fence. Is it becoming a problem, uh, Joey, uh, with so many favorites winning all the time? I, I, was, no, I, I, saw, I saw somebody on Twitter uh, who said, you know, um, and these, this guy bets on the UFC, he lives in Vegas. And he said his buddy was in town for Super Bowl weekend, didn't know anything about the UFC, but he went 6-0 and taking favorites. They yeah, just blindly filled out the sheet. Favorite, 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 favorite. Uh, Trillo won, but you know, as a small underdog. But it seems like the favorites just are, you know, raking it in on these cards, Joey. But the number's right because you won't see the number move that much. You've got the guys that aren't going to lay that high price, and the number. No, you got to parlay. That, yeah, you got to parlay. It's the only way. Otherwise, you're well, right because it even evens out. So, I mean, anything can happen in a fight, but these guys, they just. Uh, you know, the number's right. You don't see a lot of, you, you might not see a lot of volume on a lot of these fights. The more cards are at the less volume, you might see some sharper action coming on the favorites. Some of these favorites are the right favorites. We used to have days when they were absolutely the wrong favorites, and they jumped off the page at you. That's not the case anymore. You know, the numbers are tightening up a little bit, social media, everything like that. But what's great is everybody's got a different opinion, so it's making a number kind of stable, which makes everybody think that, you know, lack of, you know, I mean, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Joey Odessa with us. Uh, so, Joey, before we let you go, we got Musasi and Machida a couple of weeks away here, week and a half uh, away. Uh, you know, you know Musasi well. Diehard fight fans know Musasi well. But the average UFC fan has heard about him. And, you know, we hear about how talented he is. And, you know, he's, he's amongst the best in the world. But now he's got an opportunity to sort of prove it against a name brand fighter that everybody in North America knows uh, in Machida. Uh, a tough spot for him in Brazil taking on Machida. Machida's a tough fighter to get a read on. Machida recently said that he took the criticism to heart that he was a boring fighter and he's looking to finish fights uh, now. And you know, the guy was losing fights because he wasn't finishing fights before with Machida. I know you've been a big Musasi fan in the past. What do you make of this matchup right now? I think Machida eats him alive. Um, I really do. I, I don't see. I don't. I don't know how Masasi beats him. Masasi's gonna have to stop him to beat him in Brazil. I. I, I mean, even though Machida lost to Phil Davis down there, I mean, Masasi is not on Phil Davis. I mean, and if you look back, you know, you go down his, the list of his wins. Um, there was a fighter last week, and we did all over him. I mean, let's look at the. Uh, you know, I'm just not putting a ton of. Uh, you know, and it's, I shouldn't say it, but it's the truth. I just not putting a ton of faith in Musasi's wins. I mean, you're talking about a guy that back, you know, and it's been you know years since those Grand Prix. But talking about a guy that was such a huge underdog, you know, you're talking forty, fifty to one against the field to win the Grand Prix over in Japan, and uh, you know that was their perception. And he had a couple of decent wins. Well, actually, he had a lot of good wins, but he hasn't done anything recently. I mean, in my opinion. I mean, Mike Kyle, uh, he, he fought a Japanese fighter. He, he drew with Keith Jardine. That was kind of a fluke thing. Uh, he, he lost to King Mo. Yeah. You know, before, some of his wins, though, you know, so could you. Goodrich. Um, gosh, I, you know, again, I'll oh, beat St. Pru, but please, you know, three-round decision. Joey Odessa. Follow him on Twitter at MMA Odds, uh, Twitter.com. And uh, Joey joins me on Sirius XM Channel 167 every Tuesday night at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, MMA Meltdown Radio. Joey, it's always a pleasure. And my pleasure. And poor Carmont. I mean, what he's in store for down there. Yeah, poor anyone, TriStar. We'll see what happens with Rory. Rory better uh, not hope it goes to the judges uh, with Damian Myatt. Honestly, uh, Joey, I know we said hindsight's twenty twenty here, but don't expect to see TriStar get any breaks uh, <laughs> anytime soon. Yeah, that thirty twenty seven just was to me was puzzling. I mean, I could make a case for either guy winning, but thirty twenty seven just didn't work in that foul. Well, I thought, you know, Medeski. listen, Medeski won the fight, but he didn't do anything. Uh, he wasn't doing anything, and the Patrick guy was trying to do something, but isn't very good, so it wasn't really accomplishing uh, anything. It was a strange uh, fight, but uh, Joey, it's always a pleasure, my man. We'll catch up with you next week. Thanks, you Have a good one. Joey Odessa. 
MMA Meltdown. We'll come back and uh, wrap things up. You're watching the Fight Network. Well, that wraps up another edition of MMA Meltdown. Thanks to Stitch Duran for joining us. Thanks to John Ramdean of the Fight Network for joining us. And it's always a pleasure talking with Joey Odessa. Hey, if you've got any great videos out there that you want us to play on the program, fire them off to me at Twitter, twitter.com slash SportsRage for my daily picks. Log on to SportsRageTV.com. Shout out to everyone here at the Fight Network. A job well done. We'll catch you guys next week. Other than that, you're on your own. Later.